Welcome to the First Cut Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is your round three recap of the BMW Championship. And joining me to break it all down, it's Kyle Porter. And Kyle, this is this is your utopia, right? We've got two guys under par. Well, I was going to say, I haven't been on, uh, I wasn't on Thursday or Friday, and I've been dying to talk about <laughs> how much I love this. I mean, NBC, I'm surprised they haven't changed the promo for the 120th U.S. Open at Wingfoot. It's the 121st U.S. Open. After this week at Olympia Fields, this is, this is the best. And, I mean, we can get into it, but I think people look at the, the score to par and it's like, okay, whatever, man. Like if you want to make it a 73, make it a 73. I, I just like that the course is identifying the best ball strikers, right? Because that's, that's what we want in any given week. That's, that's where your boy Ben on has a chance to win the golf tournament. That's and right. it, it doesn't become just this putting con- contest between guys like Kevin Streelman and, and whoever, no offense to Kevin Streelman. He played great. He shot a 66 today. He played great. Um, so I just, I, I love, the setup. I love everything about it. I I think it's been, I think it's been a lot of fun to watch so far. It's amazing what firm and fast conditions will do to professional golfers. Like that's it. You don't do anything crazy, make them firm, make them fast. I guess the the length of this course helps as well. A couple stats off the top, the last non-major one with an even par score. That was the 1995 tour championship. That was Billy Mayfair at Southern Hills. The last non-major with an over par score, 1981 AT&T Byron Nelson, Bruce Litsky one over. So KP, what, what do you think? You think this thing ends up over par? Well, it, you know, it played about a, what was it? A stroke and a half easier on Saturday than it did on Thursday. It, it, it depends on the setup. It depends on the pins on Sunday, right? Like I, I think that, um, I don't know. I, I'm going to say even, is that a cop out? Yes, it is. But we will let you get away with it. Uh, so D- so I, Will Gray had this great set. DJ, when he went one under on uh, 15, I think, first time he'd been under par all week. That's crazy. Okay, because that was – I'm, I'm surprised, but I'm also not surprised because when I was on with Greg last night, I was like, oh, like – are we going to talk about the fact that Dustin Johnson is just like ho hum two shots back here or one shot back or whatever? Yeah, yeah. Like he just like he just snuck up on us. So like I I guess I was I guess I'm not surprised to hear that that was the first time he got under par. What uh 30, 51 holes in or something? I think you go. I mean you go two fifty four his final score at TPC Boston and then you win Olympia Fields at two eighty. Like that's that's sick. Like to 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 do that back to back weeks now I. I don't know. We can talk about DJ here in a second, but um, uh, by the way, one other thing I wanted to bring up real quick. Did you see Justin Thomas on, I don't, I think it was on golf channel. I don't think it was on PGA tour live. His shot into the par three on, on Saturday. Is that the shot that he declared the worst <laughs> shot in the history of the sport? <laughs> <laughs> and he hit the middle of the green. It was, I mean, it didn't cut the way that he wanted it to, but it was just, I think you guys, you see guys get so frustrated over when they don't have complete control over their ball in a week like this, because you have to, um, to be able to set yourself up to score. And it was just, it was the best. It was so funny. He basically hit it pin high on a course that is playing a shot and a half over par. And he called it the worst shot in the history of golf. But I think, and then he three putted. So that's true. There you go. Paul, don't lie. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, All right, let's talk about DJ. So he is obviously your uh, betting favorite. He is tied with Hideki Matsuyama at one under. They are the only two golfers under par. This is the wild thing. I mean, we talked about, you know, the Northern Trust, but even going back to the PGA Championship, he has now held the 54-hole lead or co-lead in each of his last three starts on tour. Now, I feel like we've gone through a lifetime with DJ in the last seven weeks. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, we, we've, we've written his obituary. Um, we've now declared him back. Now he's like on the verge of potentially becoming the player of the year. Like this is, I, I can't even describe the highs and lows we've gone through in the last seven weeks. It has been crazy. You know, I, in watching his round on Saturday, I'm curious to see your opinion on this. It, it almost felt like, I think I said on HQ is the worst score he could have shot, which is a very like, you know, people throw that around all the time. It doesn't, it's kind of meaningless, but I couldn't think of anything else to say. Uh, it felt like he left put sh- like a lot of putts short, like three or four of them. Yeah. And on a course like this, it's like, I don't, I mean, maybe they were uphill. I could, I, I, I don't remember each one of them, but it was weird that he was leaving putts short. I, I just, I think he's striking the, 
hell out of it. Like it's just been, it's been unbelievable to watch. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think he lost, like, I think he was almost a zero putter on Saturday. I think he might've lost like a half stroke or something like that. Uh, but it's, I guess what I'm saying is it's easy to envision a couple of those putts dropping on Sunday. He gets to two under and that's, you know, that's Vince Carter dot give. I, I wanted to ask you, do you think he's more likely to just projecting this ahead? Do you think he's more likely to win the FedEx cup next week? He's going to go in with, you know, 10 under eight under or to win uh wing foot. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know. Okay. I didn't know where you were going to go with that. Okay. Interesting. Uh, probably. It, it has to be still next week. It's a 30 man field. He's going to start two shots up. Yeah. Um, although I, I was going to say like, I'm, I'm cooling off on like the two, the, the, the two shot thing. Like it's obviously a big difference between 10 shots between the guy who's in first and the guy who's in 30th. But mm-hmm. um, I'm, I'm kind of cooling on thinking like, I used to think two shots was almost insurmountable. And now I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> now I'm like, I don't, I don't really care. Like, I, I guess it's nice to have, but like, it's not, it's, it's not as if you've earned those earned a two shot lead, right? Like you could just go in next week and not have it and, and cough that up four holes in. Yeah. I no. think that's, a, I, I mean, uh, JT last year played it three under and you're like, well, even if he would have had a eight shot lead, or I, I mean, it, it just, it didn't. Yeah. It doesn't matter in, it matters. I think more if you tack it on to the end of a week, than if you're starting there at the beginning, because of what mm-hmm. you said, if it's the guy that's hitting the ball 25th best in the field, then it's whatever. Like it, it means it's meaningless. Yeah. Um, Hideki Matsuyama also one under. So he is going to play with Dustin Johnson again on Sunday. You mentioned that was a comfortable pairing. I loved that on (laughs) HQ. Uh, What I thought was most interesting about Hideki's round on Saturday was he started off gangbusters. I mean, he literally, he holds a bunker shot on, on one for Eagle. He makes birdie on four. So through four holes, he's three under then he kind of lost it in the middle. Uh, yeah. Kind of, kind of lost the driver. I think they were saying on the telecast. He like, that's the first fairway he's hit in an hour and forty five minutes. And I was like, yeah. oh yeah, that feels right. It's been a while. Uh, but then he was able to kind of right the ship a little bit. And he played from he played his last eight holes at one under to get in uh, one under for the round and like survive, which I thought was commendable. Yeah, I, I think what's a little worrisome about him, and you were on this with Cantlay going into Saturday where can't like holes out from 50 yards. He, he's got a couple of weird things that happen and it felt like a little bit of an not undeserved is the wrong word, but it didn't, it didn't feel like he should have been in the final pairing. And I, this is weird to say about somebody who's first in strokes gain T to green about Hideki, but he's had some hole outs. He chipped in, he, he hold out from the sand on, on Saturday on one uh, to make Eagle there. So it, I, I don't know. Like he's lost strokes on approach shots e- each of the last two days, even though he was first in the field in that category on Thursday. So I'm a little, I don't have as much, this is crazy to say about somebody who, um, you know, DJ shot 80, 80, 78, like six weeks ago, but I have way <laughs> more, I have way more confidence in kind of where his swing is at than I do with Hideki right now. Yeah. Well, Hideki leads in T to green, but he also leads in strokes gained around the green, which is where like all of that is coming from. He's why, gained- why, why doesn't the tour do a, a strokes game ball striking? I don't know. I don't know. It'd be very, it's very simple. You have the numbers there. Just add those two columns together and then do a short game one and add the other ones together. Yeah. I, I don't, they should just be official stats. I do not know why they're it's, it's no more work. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't either. Hideki's only hit 15 fairways. Yeah, he he's kind of been so so you're right that like okay, so the the timeliness aspect of and this is where a little bit of mark coming out of me here like if you can just, you know, hole out once or twice around not right not around once or twice a week, uh roll in a couple of putts, you know, the numbers look different than the actual result is and and I also do feel like and Greg Greg and I were trying to get I was trying to get this with Greg last night is like in a week like this it's just kind of get the ball in the hole any way you can. You know what I mean? Like, like we're seeing a lot of hole outs because guys are missing fairways guy, or guys are missing greens. They're, they're chipping in a lot, but I don't, I think it's still unsustainable, but I'm not sure how bad it is this week. Well, and here's, here's the difficult part about 
not that anybody wants to hear about how hard our jobs are, but <laughs> if you, if you like talking about it right now is very different than talking about it on Sunday night. So Sunday night, if a shoots 74 or whatever, we can be like, well, yeah, he wasn't really striking it that well for off the tee and with his irons. Right. And then if he wins, you're like, well, yeah, he holed out three times <laughs> on, on Thursday through Saturday. Like that's what happens when you win in a week. So it's just, I think it's hard to sit, to, to, to look at it on Saturday night and know which way it's going to go. I, I just think I go into Sunday without as much confidence in, in Hideki as I do with somebody like a DJ or even I, I think like with Rory right now. Okay. We're going to talk about Rory. We're going to talk about Adam Scott first though. So let's, let's get a little confidence level on, on Adam Scott, who is second in the field in strokes gained putting with this week with the broom. Yeah. And uh, you know, this is very reminiscent, obviously not as difficult, but he, he goes out, he wins Genesis, which, you know, the, the Riv is one of the more difficult courses we see on the PGA tour. He is uh, not afraid to get kind of uh, gritty out there and, and win one of these. So, Bones told a story on the broadcast. You probably heard it about how uh, one time Adam Scott picked up Phil's driver at Eastlake and hit a 285 yard draw down the middle, uh, like I've left, heard. left-handed and somebody, somebody responded to me and said, has he ever tried putting left-handed? <laughs> <laughs> Which is sort of coincidental because he's actually putting it great this week yeah. and he's, and he's not driving it very well. And so, you know, I, I I'm curious about your take on this. Cause I, I think we came into this week thinking you got to drive it. Well, you got to drive it. Well, you got to drive it. Well, Adam Scott's almost last in the field of driving and he's, he's up near the top of the leaderboard. Why, why do you, I mean, is that just a, nobody's driving it well? Is that like, what, what, I don't know. Like what, what, what's the, what's going on there? I think there's a lot of things. So he's doing it the Mark Leishman way at what Leishman did to Tory Pines, which is miss every fairway and still win the golf tournament, which yeah. uh, is insane. But I, I think that, a lot of it is luck, quite frankly. Like some of the lies that you draw in this thick rough, they can be bad or they can be really, really bad. And and we've seen guys try to bite off more than they can chew. We saw Justin Thomas, I think it was on Friday, try to bite off more than he can chew. He hits it in the penalty area in front of the green on whatever hole that is. I mean, I just think that there's a lot of luck involved in it. And I think that there is even more strategy this week than most weeks because you have to be able to look at your lie, look at your situation and say, how am I, how, how now am I going to attack this hole? And I just think some guys do it better. And I think Adam Scott is a very good thinker on the golf course. And it's kind of able to, I don't know, figure itself out along the way. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, He is top 10 in, in uh, iron play as well. So again, it, it's chicken or the egg is, is he somebody who, I mean, he's one of the best drivers of all time. So does it just click on Sunday or is it, is it trending in the wrong direction? It's, I, I, feel, I think it's so hard to sit here on Saturday night and try to try to differentiate that, especially with somebody like Adam Scott. Yeah, for sure. Uh, John Rom goes out early, shoots a 66 with, with Oh, by the way, uh, a penalty on five, for literally picking his ball up on the green without marking it. Have, okay. Have you ever done this? Like, I mean, I do it all the time, but like not when I'm actually trying to mark my ball. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I usually go the, the, uh, remember when DJ at the, uh, the charity event marked it with a T that's what I usually yeah. do. <laughs> I go, I go with the DJ T, but it, the, the funny part, we were talking about this before we started, if you saw the footage of it, he immediately realized what he did. And it was like, he was, he was just like, he, he like just froze as if that yes. was going to, as if it was going to keep him from getting more penalty strokes. Right. He, he, he just stood there. I, I get, I assume it's because he knew he had to replace it and he didn't want to walk around and lose the spot, but he literally <laughs> stood there. He stood there until the rules official got there. And if you've ever seen a rules official get to somebody on the PGA tour, like it's not that speedy. Yeah. So he stood in the same <laughs> spot for how, I don't know, two minutes or whatever, which is a long time. And yeah, with his body turned to the side. I mean, it was comical. Uh, he he kind of brushed it off afterwards and was like, "It was." I mean, it was a brain cramp. He literally just brain cramped and forgot to put a a marker down. It was unbelievable. It, it's kind of sick to shoot sixty six with a penalty, though. I mean, he was. Other than that, he was bogey free. I mean, bogey free sixty six on this course. I I know that it was like a stroke and a half easier on on Saturday, but. You know, and, and I don't know, I am interested. I, I, I would be interested and maybe data golf has this, maybe you have this in morning, afternoon, 
like I, I can't imagine that morning is, I, I have to think afternoon's harder, right? Because it, it, it dries out, it gets firmer. Um, it was a shot harder today. Okay. So yeah. So that, so that makes, I don't know. I mean, Rory said earlier this week, like, look, this is playing, this is like Muirfield village, right? John Rahm wins Muirfield village by quite a few <laughs> other than the yeah. penalty that he had there also. So I, I think that, I mean, to go 66, what would he have to go on, on Sunday? 67, probably maybe, maybe 68 playoff. I, I don't know. That would be, that would be pretty impressive at Olympia fields. If you go Muirfield village in those conditions, Olympia fields in these conditions, that's a, those are pretty, those are two pretty good tournaments to win. Yeah, the two rounds of the day, the 266 is Streelman and John Rahm. They were both out early, uh, which, by the way, on the pod last night, I, I was like, yeah, I think there might be a 66 out there tomorrow. And Greg's like, immediately, like, John Rahm's going to shoot a 66 tomorrow. And I was like, okay, sure. And here we go. I, Greg, Greg looking I, into the future. I want to see Greg predict a Kevin Streelman 66 after he <laughs> shot 80 on Friday. That would, that would have, I would have been impressed by that. Uh, you, you know, there is, I can't wait for the moment where, um, so wherever John Rom finishes, let's just assume one shot would have gotten him another stroke next week at yeah. the tour championship. And then he loses the tour championship by one shot. And we get all the tweets of John Rom forgot to mark his ball and it cost him $15 million. Yeah. yeah well, it, be, it would cost him 10, but still. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. True. It's not 15 million or nothing. It, it would, it would, it would be a lot. Rory McIlroy, uh, eventful day. Not only is he playing golf on a very difficult golf course, uh, not only does he shoot three over 73, but we get the confirmation that his wife is due any day now and he's having a baby girl. How about that? Yeah, it's awesome. Girl dad, it's the best. Can confirm. Can confirm. Um, (laughs) I'm curious. He doesn't, he he did say in his, I read his his quotes afterwards. He doesn't have the, uh, I guess it's 2020. I don't know if you can even find a beeper, but he doesn't have the, the Phil beeper from uh, Pinehurst. Uh, but he did say his caddy, Harry Diamond, has his phone in his pocket uh, at all times. So he's, I did think about this scenario. He said, like, look, whenever it is, I'm out. Like, if it's final round of BMW, if it's second round of tour championship, it would be pretty intense if it was final round of tour championship. I mean, think about last year. He's in the final pairing with Brooks, and you get to, like, the seventh hole, you're like, See you guys. Oh man. There's 15 mil sitting around <laughs> the final green at East Lake. Oh, let me tell you how the, uh, the DFS and gambling community would take that. Uh, <laughs> spoiler alert, not good, <laughs> but he, he look like he, he of, of all the guys out there has, yeah, you know, some of the best perspective and yeah, it, it's cool. I'm, I'm, it, it's a cool thing for them. Um, yeah. Roy's Roy's the best. Yeah, he, yeah he mentioned, for sure. He, he, I think, I think he, they had said like he was worried, like jokingly worried that his wife Erica wouldn't call him because like <laughs> it just have the baby without him, so that he doesn't have to, like he, 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 she knows he's playing. Just yeah. keep playing. I'll just have the baby. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. I mean, the timing of it. If you could like somehow work it out to between Tour Championship and and U.S. Open would be. A plus, but you know, he said, he said after Saturday, he was like, look, my mind's been wandering the last few weeks. Now you guys know why. And there was, you know, this had kind of been talked about a little bit behind the scenes. Um, And so I, I think that it's probably good for him for it to be out there. I mean, that's, it's such a big thing in your life and uh, there's a ton going on. I, I I'm really intrigued by just the idea. So two things, one, this course clearly has his attention and he's, he's, he's more focused in a way that he just hasn't been over the last six weeks or so. Um, and two, you don't, um, he, he traditionally when he wins or even when he like contends, it's not the grindy, like one over even par type victory. This would be a, I I don't know if it'd be a big deal, but it would be a, a kind of a, a unique win for somebody like Rory. He, he goes out and just boat races you at Hoy Lake or at 
yeah. um, Valhalla or wherever, where it's like, Hey, get to 20 under good luck. And he's like, Oh yeah, I got that. But to do it with in this gear where you have to hit somebody on the broadcast said, uh, you had to hit mature shots, mm. Like you had, you had to be very mature in like which pins you're going after and which you're not going after. I think that's something that he's kind of grown in that he probably didn't get enough credit for over at, like as he's gotten older. So I, I'm intrigued to see how that goes on, on Sunday. We're, we're going to move on here, but the, okay. 11 where he, I thought this was the most mature thing. He basically drove the green on 11. He was like 29 yards out and he played it out to the right pin. Instead of going at the pin, he paid, played it correctly out to the right, used the contour, gave himself an eight footer and rolled it in. And I was like, Yo, that was smart, Rory. Like, yeah. I, I would have gone right at the flag stick and screwed this up. That's yeah. why you're the man. Uh, yeah. It was it was very mature. Uh, Tiger Woods. We got to talk about Tiger, but first we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners. Tiger Woods uh, continues his struggles, has now played three rounds over par, which I guess is not all that terrible, KP, but his Saturday round, um, man, it's just like, he can't put it all together, right? I mean, he he goes out, he's two under through his first four holes. You're thinking, okay, things are all looking good here. And then he kind of loses it again. And he, and he bogeys 10, he makes the really ugly triple on 17. And when it's all said and done, he shoots a 72, two over par. And now he's 10 over and 11 shots off the lead. Yeah, it's not, I mean, 17 was a disaster. And... I don't know. We talked about this a little, bit on, a little bit on HQ. I don't know which part of his game he's concerned with the most right now. Um, he's had this right miss all week. That's what, that's, he, he missed off uh, to the right on 17, hit it in the water. Um, and then the putter, I don't know. I mean, it was better on Saturday, but it's still just – I, he's just not sharp enough. I mean, you're, you, you, and you get these, these mar- I mean, he's, he's, he's playing okay, but these margins that you see on a course like Olympia fields on a course like wing foot, they're so small, but they're the difference between 10 over and one under, I mean, right. Like he's not, he's not playing like that poorly, but then all of a sudden you look up after 54 holes and you're 11 down to the guy who's the best player in the world. And you're like, man, I, I just, it, it's, I don't know. I, I, in some ways that's encouraging. Cause you're like, well, if I just tighten up these things, like just a tiny amount, I can maybe work my way up there. But I feel like we've been saying that about him for like a month now. And, and I think here's the biggest problem is if you're not going to putt well, which he's, he's not putted well the entire year. If you're not going to putt well, uh, and you're going to rely on your irons, which, by the way, is some of the, he's got some of the best approach numbers on tour. If you're going to rely on that, you have to hit the fairway. Yeah. And 19 out of 42 fairways, that, that's not it. I mean, he's nearly last in the field in strokes gained off the tee. You just, you just lose your advantage. So if, you're whole, if your big advantage is your irons and your wedges, it doesn't matter when you're hitting it out of the rough, right? Like, you just lose that advantage. So it's, it's almost like... He can't save himself with a putter anymore. The driver was always wild, but he could kind of get away with it. But now he's got this one thing that he can't unleash unless he's in the fairway. Yeah, it's a little bit of, I mean, this is kind of what I saw with Rory on, on Saturday a little bit where you're, you're just not giving yourself, you, like if you're not, it, like you said, if you're not going to putt well, if you're going to be JT in Memphis putting where you lose strokes, you got to be unreal from T to green. Now you can win like that. Contrary to what Mark thinks you, you can absolutely <laughs> win like that. You just have to be lights out for 72 holes from, from T to green. And when you're not, and I mean, this, th- that's the thing about Tiger. He was always able to sort of like when he wasn't, you know, when he was missing fairways, when he's missing greens, his short game was just un- so unreal that he would save himself. He'd save himself. He'd lag putt, he'd lag putt. And or he'd chip up close and, and he's like the short game just isn't sharp enough to do that right now. And as a result, he's not scoring, he's not scoring at all. I mean, no. he's not really hitting it that poorly, but he's not scoring at all because of kind of the formula that you just mentioned. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about some guys who could be hoisting the trophy on Sunday evening. It should be no surprise that Dustin Johnson is your betting favorite. He is plus one eighty eight. Thanks to our friends over at William Hill. Hideki Matsuyama, three and a half to one. John Rahm is nine to one. But I have a feeling, Kyle, I might be able to offer you Rory McIlroy at 10 to one. 
What were what were his odds coming into the week? Eight, I think he was eighteen. He he has he has slipped over the past couple of weeks with all these other big boys winning golf tournaments. I think okay. he was eight, 16, 18 to one, something like that. Yeah, you know, I think historically the ten makes sense because you're like, okay, really difficult, grindy course. Rory three back on a Sunday doesn't really feel like the formula for him winning. Uh, but I don't know. I mean, ten to one is kind of a lot. I mean, that's what he, if you go back to what, uh, probably PGA, he's probably 10 to one going in. Yeah. Now he's within the, you know, the third to last group on a, or maybe the fourth to last group on a Sunday. Um, I don't know. I might take that. It's a pretty enticing number. I got to say, I mean, you, you don't usually get Rory McIlroy anywhere sniffing the lead on a Sunday at this number. I, I, I don't, I don't think it's bad. It would be great if he got like, if he got the phone call on like 17 and he's leading and he just, he just, he, he just gets it to the house. Like he just plays 17 and 18 as fast as he can. He leaves, he ends up winning <laughs> and there's and, no trophy ceremony. And, and he's not even there. That would be incredible. I, that would be awesome. That would be I so cool. Um, man, I, I, I think Dustin Johnson probably wins this, but I wouldn't want to bet it. Um, it's, it's not juicy enough, but you're talking about a guy and I can't believe I'm saying he's just, he's just so unflappable, right? I just, it just, he seems so locked in. Um, I don't, I, I also do think there could be carnage tomorrow. Like what if, like how far back is John Rom? Two back? Three back? I, I need, yeah, he's three. I need, I need a dirty setup in the morning. Like I need it to be just nasty. Uh, what's Joaquin Neiman? All right. Neiman is 20 to one. That's interesting. He's uh, he. Okay. There's a big thing about like, can you actually win a golf tournament? And Neiman can actually win golf tournaments. And he tried to steal heritage away from Webb Simpson earlier this year before he made like a bad bogey on like 16 or 17 coming in. But like he tried to steal that Neiman can actually win. And he's 20 to one. I uh, producer Jacob is trying to derail this podcast. I saw it too. He said, he said, <laughs> I need a dirty setup. Could be a great t-shirt. I do. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how else to put that. Uh, I looked up. So during his third round on Saturday, I looked up Neiman's odds at uh, Wingfoot. Mm-hmm. Hundred to one. Ooh, he's got. He listen, look, like I, I get it. His finishes have not been great. He's got every shot. I mean, you yeah. just watch him, and you're like, oh, this feels like a U.S. Open guy, right? And and so I think it, he's somebody who is. I just think is extremely. He just benefits from this type of setup because it it highlights what he does really well, and he doesn't have to put it that well to, to kind of get into contention. And so I, I don't know. I, I think at 20 to one, he, he's an interesting guy for Sunday. And, and speaking of like wing foot, like here's what I said last week about Dustin Johnson. Like, it doesn't matter if you finish second or second to last, like Joaquin Neiman might it, like he has the ability to win a golf tournament. He has yeah. the upside. He has the floor. Yeah. Uh, all right, KP, that'll do it. The first cup pod will be back for a final round podcast on Sunday evening. You can find Kyle at, Kyle Porter, CBS. You can find me at Rick Rungood. This has been the first cut and we'll catch you next time.